I am not there with you today, but an incredible clergy person is. And I will be back with you next week. So in the meantime, I hope you give your full attention and devotion this morning in worship to the Reverend David Heinemann. David was serving as the campus minister of the Wesley Foundation, the Methodist campus ministry at the College of William and Mary when I was there as an undergraduate student. I've had the absolute honor of knowing David for two decades. And now that he's retired, I still get to experience his glory on the board of ordained ministry where we both serve. And so this morning, he has graciously come to lead worship and to bring you the ministry of the word while I am on vacation. And I look forward to hearing about the experience that you've had and seeing you again next week. Please, with the warmest welcome, enjoy and provide your incredible hospitality to David Heinemann. Well, good morning. Good morning. So 20, two decades we've known each other. That means I'm really, really old. Uh, and she was very, very nice, but one of the first things that Sarah learned in seminary was that when you're away on vacation, you get somebody who's a worse preacher than you, <laughs> so that people are really glad when you're back, you know? So, so y'all are going to be so glad to see Pastor Sarah next Sunday, you just don't know it. You just don't know it. Uh, and clearly, I am not Pastor Sarah. I am not a shoe horse. Um, so, but I did polish my shoes today, which is kind of a step up from me. My mother would be so proud of me that I polished my shoes for y'all. But I want to welcome you to Crozet Church. I've met some of you as we were gathering for worship. I don't know what in particular brought you to worship today. It might be because this is just what you do on Sunday morning, right? You show up for worship. Uh, somebody may have invited you as a friend some time ago and you decided to stick. Um, some of you came because, as I used to say to my kids, trust me, you get a better dad at the end of the service than the one you brought with you. And they didn't understand what that meant, but it was just kind of a, a way for me to recharge and get myself back together and focused about what really matters. And maybe that's why you're here. Maybe it's because the, your prayer for today, for this week, has been thanks. For somebody else, your prayer for this week might have been, wow. Somebody else's prayer might have been, help. <laughs> and maybe somebody's here because their prayer is, sorry. Whatever has brought you here today, I know who brought you here because it is the God who welcomes all of us, who has gathered us together as Christ's body and worship. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad that Christ has brought us together for whatever reason, so that we might bless and praise and glorify him. Amen. So, of the many things you could have done today, I am grateful that you chose to be drawn here to worship. So let us worship together. I invite you as you're able to stand for our call to worship. Is that what you do? This is what happens when you get help to come in. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. And we are going to sing a song that y'all have been learning, Grace Greater Than uh, All Our Sin. This is one of 500 hymns that was written by the author Julia Harriet Johnston. And in it, she's talking about the relationship between God's grace and how that helps us to be in the right with God through faith. And so she contrasts God's abundant, infinite, marvelous grace with our sin and guilt. And the final stanza invites all of us, whoever we are, to receive that gift of grace and the life that it brings. So I invite you to stand and let's sing these wonderful words together.
you join with me in the gathering liturgy? The Lord has been mindful of us, and he will bless us. He will bless us. He will bless those who fear the Lord. May the Lord increase you more and more. May you be blessed by the Lord. The heaven of heavens is the Lord's. The dead. Do not praise the Lord. But we, we will bless the Lord. From this time forth, forevermore. Hallelujah. Not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. And let us pray together. In the light of the morning, Lord, we glorify your name. May the mystery of your incarnation shine through the complexities of this day so that in all we do, your name might be praised. Amen. You may be seated. And I love this pondering that Sarah has shared with us today. It is this, well, let me back up and say, Easter Sunday was always a hard Sunday for me to preach because I felt like what was being asked of me was to bring people the ocean and all I had was a juice glass. I just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't fill it all in. There was just so much more. And I think that um, uh, Melito of Sardis is doing a, a similar kind of thing. He's trying to wrap his mind and his heart around this mystery that the infinite, incomprehensible God has taken shape in a human being, in a human life, and has come to live the divine life with us so that our lives might become divine. And so listen and ponder these words from Melito of Sardis. Nature trembled and said with astonishment, what new mystery is this? The judge is judged and remains silent. The invisible one is seen and does not hide himself. The incomprehensible one is comprehended and does not resist. The unmeasurable one is measured and does not struggle. The one beyond suffering suffers and does not avenge himself. The immortal one dies and does not refuse death. What new mystery is this? Oh, shoot. <laughs> there you go, let's stay. just can't get good help, can you? <laughs> I invite you to be seated. And I got to tell you, my daughter's name is Grace. 
So that I, if we kind of chose that so every time the roll was called, we could kind of send a theological shot across the bow. Grace, I'm here. Grace is everywhere. Grace abounds. Grace is amazing. And she loves the Gloria Patri. So she would just be, what is wrong with you? You left out the Gloria Patri. So we're all straight now, Grace, wherever you are. Sorry. Now, I don't see any young'uns. I mean, we're all children of God, right? But I don't see any short children of God. So the lady who was hoping she was not going to have to listen to the sermon because she'd have children with her. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so I won't tell that story, but you stay put. Got my eyes on you. Okay. So I want to share, no, actually, I'm going to be quiet because somebody's going to read the song. All right? Nope, we're going to, we're going to stay together. No, they're going to sing the anthem now. Good morning. This is a reading of Psalm 51, verses 1 through 9. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom 
in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. This is the word of God for the people of God. Man, that was worth the wait. Both because of the anthem, which was rocking, and because you read scripture like it really matters. I've got some clergy friends that they read scripture, and I'm like, would you just sit down and be quiet? Because you're re- it sounds like you're reading from the phone book, and what you're actually reading are words of life. So thank you for making those words on the page become a prayer for us. You may or may not <clears throat> know that, that the 51st Psalm, if you look at the little footnote at the beginning of that, says that this is a prayer that David offered after Nathan the prophet had confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba. And that's what we're going to be talking about today so that you know that the story is not going to end well because David has this prayer of the heart that he offers in which he says, I have done a terrible thing. But there's also that wonderful message, creating me a clean heart, that God is not finished with us. Restore and renew our right spirit within me, which is a word of of hope. And so for our scripture this morning, I want to kind of hit the highlights of the scripture that we're going to hear from 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And I invite you to go home and read the whole story in all of its gore and glory, just to make sure that I'm not lying, that this really is in the Bible. Um, and, and, and just kind of get into the story itself because it is a powerful, awesome, and awful story that does end with grace and hope. So listen to these words from Second Samuel beginning with verses from chapter 11 and then chapter 12. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. And then some things happen, and the story continues. When the wife of Uriah, that's Bathsheba, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor, The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, 
and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's been 35 years but I remember it like it happened yesterday. I was in a Bible study with a group of students at the Wesley Foundation at William & Mary. It was a presidential election year, and they wanted to study King David. I mean, after all, he was Israel's greatest leader, and he might provide some clues in his life about what good leadership looks like. And so one night, we focused on this story we just read about David and Bathsheba, Nathan and, and Joab. And to, and to get us into the story, I asked the students to imagine themselves as one of the characters in the story. David, Bathsheba, Uriah, Joab, Nathan. And then as that character, I invited them to imagine that they were writing at the end of the day an entry in their diary about what had happened that day. And one of the students in this group was a very shy, very quiet 20-year-old woman. And I have to confess, I was not prepared with, for what this mousy young woman wrote. Because, you see, she had imagined herself as Bathsheba, and when she shared her diary entry, she said, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do what the king wanted. But when it's the king, what can you do? It was an eye-opening experience for me because I had read this story many times and not once had I ever considered that David had raped Bathsheba. Now, you women folk might say, well, what is wrong with you, fool? Of course that's what's happening in this story, but I had never seen it that way. I had never seen that this was a, 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 a situation of David abusing the power that he had and inflicting it on somebody who couldn't help themselves. Now, some of you in this room are, are uh, perhaps, perhaps maybe old enough, I don't know, to remember the 1985 movie King David that was starring a very young Dave, Richard Gere very young Richard Gere. And in that movie, if you watch it, Bathsheba is portrayed as a seductress, a vixen who knows exactly what she's doing as she looks with bedroom eyes at David as David sees her taking a bath. And in the story, Uriah is not a good guy. He's an abusive partner so that in some ways David is really doing Bathsheba a favor. And in the 1951 movie that stars Gregory Peck and uh, Rita Hayward, and nobody in this room is old enough to remember that. I know, but, but trust me, that's what the story is about. It, it becomes a love story. There, there's an honest sister who's owning it. They cre Hollywood creates this love story that, that Bathsheba is an unappreciated woman and, and Uriah is an indifferent husband who doesn't care about how beautiful and wonderful she is. And so David comes across as the hero who rescues her from this. And you see, I had looked at this story through the lens of pop culture and missed something that this woman had not missed. And it was very eye-opening for me. So let's let the story speak for itself as we find it in scripture. David is so powerful that in the season when kings go off to war, he goes upstairs and takes a nap. He sends somebody else to do the fighting and the dying for him. And Bathsheba is at her house, minding her own business, 
taking a bath when a peeping Tom David sees her. And in the King James Version, David sends for her and takes her. He takes her. That's the language of rape. There's nothing here of romance or mutual love or desire or an ongoing relationship. It's one and done and Bathsheba goes home and only later does David get a message, I'm pregnant. So David, being a wise and powerful king, does what the wise and the powerful do. He tries to cover it up. There's no grief. There's no regret. There's no repentance. There's not really any care for the woman. David sends for Uriah, her husband, from the battlefield where he's doing the fighting while David takes a nap in the afternoon. Uriah is battle-hardened, but he is also righteous. In fact, when you read the story, he is way more righteous than David is. Nothing in the Bible says he's abusive. Nothing in the scripture says that he is an unloving, uncaring husband. Uriah arrives in Jerusalem. David pretends to be a caring king and asks about Joab and the army and the war and how everything is going. And it's really kind of ironic because he asks about the shalom, the peace the well-being of these warriors, the folks who are doing the fighting and the dying while he stays at home. And then David sends Uriah to his home and euphemistically urges him to go have sex with his wife. That's what go wash your feet means in the story. If David's lucky, Uriah will go have sex with his wife, will think that the baby is his, and David's honor will be safe and secure from all alarms. That's right, but Uriah is too good a man for that. The next day, when the sun comes up and David gets up, he learns that Uriah didn't go down to his house, but slept outside the king's house because he said, how could I go home and have sex with my wife when Israel's armies are in tents? As one translation puts it, Uriah says, on my very life, I won't do it. And little does Uriah know that, in fact, his life is on the line. After another failed attempt to get Uriah to go home, David sends Uriah back to battle, carrying his own death warrant with him. General Joab is told in this message that Uriah gives and delivers Make sure when the battle is at its worst, Uriah is on the front line. Joab reads between the lines, puts Uriah where he knows he's going to be offed, and then sends the message back to David. Oh, by the way, Uriah the Hittite is dead. And this is another sign in my mind that I totally missed when I was reading scripture all those other times. It's another sign that Bathsheba is a rape survivor. When she learns of Uriah's death, she doesn't do a happy dance. She's not going, ding dong, the witch is dead. The scripture says she mourns for him. She's not relieved. She is not giddy with romance. She mourns a good man whom apparently she loved. And later David fetches her again. She doesn't go looking for him. He's the one in charge. He takes her for a wife without a proposal, without a yes or a no. She's not the actor here. She's the victim. She's the survivor in a terrible situation. And you know what is kind of the, the nail in the coffin for all of this? Nowhere in Scripture is Bathsheba ever blamed for what happens here. She's not blamed. The Scripture says the thing David did displeased the Lord. The Hebrew here is actually stronger than that milk toast translation we just read. What David did, what David did, not Bathsheba, what David did was evil in God's eyes. 
And after the baby is born, the prophet Nathan goes to David with a story about a rich man. You heard this, got a lot of sheep. Without a care, he takes the poor man's one and only precious and beloved lamb and feeds it to his visitor. David hears this story, and boy, he's not happy about it. He is so upset, and he says, this man who has done this deserves to die, and he will pay fourfold the lamb as a punishment and a way to at least make something right and better here. And then Nathan says, you're the man. You are the man. King James says it, thou art the man. And then goes on to ream David out and says, God has given you everything you could possibly hope for. And if you wanted more, God would have given it to you. And you took what did not belong to you. You took what did not belong to you. Not only has David despised Uriah and Bathsheba, David has despised God and God's word. And he's broken in a trifecta of sin. He has broken three out of the Ten Commandments. He has coveted, he has committed adultery, and he has murdered. And David's family will pay the cost of his actions. You remember that line from Scripture that says, the father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? That's what's going to happen with David and his family. In almost a mirror of what David has done, his family, his dysfunctional family, will be marred by rape and by murder and by coveting power. And the power of those things will spread through his family faster than COVID. And Nathan says, the child will die. David tried to hide his deeds. Not that any of us have ever done that. He tried to hide his deeds, and they will be known to all what happens. David, Nathan speaks truth to power, and David admits, I was wrong. He confesses his sin. He scorned God and Uriah and Bathsheba. He sinned in thought, word, and deed against God and against neighbor, and there is judgment. But there's also grace. Grace, amazing grace, grace greater than all our sin. David has done something worthy of death. In the Bible, you read it, adultery is a capital offense. Murder is a capital offense. He has done things that are worthy of death, but still he will not die. In mercy and grace, God spares his life and gives him the opportunity to live his life differently, to walk a different way, to move from death to life. And this story says that's true for you too that you too can move from death to life, that sin and judgment are not the last word. The last word is Jesus Christ, who sets all of us free to walk a new and better life. But I have to tell you, this is a hard story, isn't it? It is such a hard story to read. It's fascinating, it's powerful, it's wonderful, and it's horrible all at the same time. In fact, there's another parallel history about David and all the kings of Judah in 1 Chronicles. And this story is so horrible, they said, mm, no, we're not going to include that story. We're going to clean it up and make everybody happy. But the story is there here. And I get that with First Chronicles. We like our heroes heroic, don't we? No flaws, always doing the right thing, able to jump tall buildings in a single bound. But the Bible here won't have it. It knows that the powerful abuse power. And we know that too. They act like they can do whatever they want, 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 and there won't be any consequences. Think of Bill Clinton and his college intern. Think of Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump with his claim that he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and be able to get away with it. Closer to home, it could be an abusive partner or a parent, or pastor, God help us. And it offends our sense of justice or fairness. That's not how the world is supposed to work. 
Sometimes we can become cynical. Sometimes we can give up in despair that such things go unpunished or are just kind of explained away or not taken seriously or people aren't held accountable for what we know they ought to be held accountable for. And it's a comfort for me in this story that not only am I offended, God is offended. Our lives are attuned to God's life when we are pained like God by abuse or injustice or when our sense of right has been violated. We as people of faith, we dare to believe that the creation is not random. It has purpose. It is going somewhere. It has direction. And that direction is good. That the universe is not without morals. We believe that justice and fairness are at the heart of the universe and that wrong won't always go unrecognized. It won't always be given a pass. And that may, I know, I know, it's Sunday morning, that may sound like that's kind of naive and Pollyannish. But do you really want to live in a world that doesn't care? Do you want to live in a world where suffering and evil and wrong are unnoticed, unrecognized, not condemned? Do you want to live in a world where God doesn't see? Where God doesn't care about the evil we inflict on each other? Sisters and brothers, it is a gift we are given that not all are able or willing to receive. But it is a gift to trust and believe that our lives matter. How we live matters. There is purpose and order to creation, and we are not doomed to an existence of chaos and craziness where only the strong survive. As the song, as the hymn says, this is our Father's world. It is our Father's world forever and always. And so the question becomes for us, how can we be God's partners? in maintaining, even creating a world of justice and fairness and righteousness. I think we start, quite honestly, here in the church, where we hold one another accountable by being honest with one another and speaking the truth in love to each other. We start by being Nathans for each other, Sometimes I wonder how much harm is being done in this world and to one another when we are not willing to tell the truth. Or when we're just going to turn a blind eye and not get involved because it might be too hard or too embarrassing or somebody might get their feelings hurt. What a gift it is. What a gift it is to have someone in our life who will say to us with love and care, what you are doing is not good for you. Or they say to us, you're going down a path that leads nowhere good. Or they love us enough to say in honesty and humility, you are better than this. You are better than this. So I am grateful For the friends I have, every friend I have who has ever held me accountable or called me out for a word or a deed that is not of Christ and to whom I can confess myself at my worst. Last week, one of those friends had a little come to Jesus meeting with me about something that I had done, something I had said, and I thanked her that she had held me accountable and loved me enough to speak truth to me, gently but honestly. And she responded back that, that there were at least two people in her life who did the same thing for her. One was her AA sponsor, and the other was a fellow follower of Jesus. In our own history as Methodists, there was a time when we did this with and for each other through what was called a class meeting, where a group of 10 or 12 people would get together each week and they would ask the question, how is it with your soul? 
which is one of the most important questions that somebody can ask you. Who are you really at your heart of hearts and how's it going this week? And don't give me any bull. Because I know you well enough that I will call you out. <laughs> because I know you will call me out as well. How is it with your soul? What a great question. A question in which people watched over one another in love week after week, challenging each other to greater faithfulness, greater obedience, greater care on the way to being made perfect in love. Friends, that's what it means to be church. That's what it means to be church, to be a community of truth and troth in the old language of the Church of England, a community of faith in which we keep our promises faithfully to live the way of Jesus together. And that's not always easy. Oh man, it's not always easy. It's not always safe. I mean, Nathan comes out okay. He's not killed by David. David says, yeah, you're right, man. I really messed it up. And accepts that honest story. But the Bible also knows folks who don't have that happy ending. All you have to do is look to Jesus on the cross, right? Jesus on the cross, who is the truth, who speaks truth, ends up on the cross and at the same time moves beyond the cross to life, right? To life. He is the true way to life. He is the one who triumphs over death to bring life. And we as church get to bear witness to that. Whenever we live together as a community that speaks truth to one another, with one another, for one another, in a community of grace and forgiveness, even when we are at our worst. Someone has said, we are not the worst thing we have ever done. We are not the worst thing we have ever done. And for me personally, that is a word of mercy and grace and life because I have to admit to you, sisters and brothers, I have done some pretty horrific things in my life, sometimes willfully so. Things that horrify me. Things that lead me to feel shame. Things that, quite honestly, some things I have never told my wife because if I told her, she would wonder, who have I married? But I have confessed them to others. And I have confessed them to God. And truth be told, I've paid some pretty heavy prices for some of those things as well, like David paid for his. Grace is abundant. Grace is amazing. Grace is abounding. But it is not cheap. Grace doesn't mean we always get to escape consequences with a wink and a nod and a never you mind. But I am not the worst thing I have ever done. And neither are you. Neither are you. Above all else, beyond the worst thing I have ever done, beyond that, I am still God's beloved, precious child, forgiven and redeemed and free, blessed by grace greater than all my sin, as the song says. And that is true for this David. It was true for King David. And it is true for you. And for us all, Amen. thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Good word, good word. It's God's word, right? Yes, it is. So it can't ever be anything but good. So I invite you to pray with me. I see the ushers are gathering together already. I know that we're going to have an offering, but not yet. <laughs> Stay. Good ushers. Good ushers. I want to invite you to pray with me a prayer formed from Psalm 51, the prayer that David offered after 
he was confronted by the truth of Nathan and the terrible things that he'd done. I invite you to pray this with me. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions against you. You alone have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach us wisdom. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Wash us. Wash us in the waters of baptism and let them continue to flow over us and we shall be whiter than snow. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. And we will give you thanks and praise. Amen. God has given us so much. The older I get, the happier I am that I wake up. Because I know that didn't have to happen. I didn't have to have breakfast today. I didn't have to have children or family or friends who love me nevertheless. I didn't have to have a body that works pretty well sometimes. I didn't have to have a mind that enables me to see and to know the wonders of this creation. There is so much I didn't have to have and yet it has been given graciously abundantly overflowing. And what else can we say but thank you, Lord? And so as we offer our gifts this morning, let us put more in the basket than just money or a check. Imagine putting ourselves into the hands of a generous God as we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done and do and will do. I invite the ushers to come forward. pray with me. God, you have given us so many beautiful, wonderful things. The gift of music, gift of art and dance and movement. 
You have given us eyes to see the creation all around us, to hear the songs of birds and the cry of the needy. You have given us hands to help. You've given us hearts to love. May they be used in such a way that you alone are glorified. And we thank you finally, not only for the opportunity to join you in this holy work, but we thank you for Jesus, who knew our life and died our death and rose for our sake. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated except for you. Ask me again. I have some announcements for this week. Um, the charge conference is scheduled for October 25th. That's this Tuesday. Crozet United Methodist Church Charge Conference is scheduled for October 25th as part of the Cluster Charge Conference at Aldergate, Aldersgate United Methodist in Charlottesville from 7 to 10, 9 p.m. Church Council is required to attend this conference to a per my goodness, to approve clergy compensation, the 2023 lay leadership of the church, candidates for ministry, and lay servants. If you have questions, reach out to Pastor Sarah or the church council chair, David Banks. Jump in and step up challenge. As we head into the final quarter of 2022, we're asking you to prayerfully consider jumping in or stepping up to the challenge of helping Crozet UMC reach its goals this year. Here's an update on our giving donations goal for September through December 2022 of $1,750,000, As a congregation, we've made significant progress towards that goal as of October 9th with giving of $64,405. That gives us a goal of $110,170 to go before the end of the year. Early November service project. We're still collecting socks for Seville Sock Love right now, and we're also going to start filling a need for the Fluvanna Correction Center this fall. We are collecting hygiene bags for the Correction Center with a deadline of November 13th. It's critical to get the sizes of items right. So for a complete list of those items and their sizes, check out the screen or the church blog, which you can find on the website. And the box for the socks is right there in the back. Children's Fellowship Group meets tonight between 4 to 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall for fun Halloween games and activities. Come on out for fun and fellowship for kindergarten through fifth graders. More information or questions, you can contact Becky Bile. Uh, hoodie offering is still going on throughout the church website. There is no middle school youth tonight. They're taking a break. And Pastor Sarah returns to the office this week. We have a closing hymn, Depth of Mercy Can There Be. I invite you to stand as you're able and let's sing together.
So a Methodist service without a Charles Wesley hymn is like a day without sunshine, right? Yeah, you just have to have that. And what a wonderful way to end this service. Depth of mercy. Can there be mercy still reserved for me? Okay, what's the answer? Yes. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> Thanks for believing the gospel that there is mercy reserved for you. When my, when my mother was, was cleaning house on Saturdays, after a while, she would start talking to herself. And, and as a four-year-old, when she was talking to herself, and she would say, I know there's a seat reserved for me in heaven. I just, I just kind of had this image of like a cloud bank with a whole bunch of folding chairs. And there was one that said, Hilda Hein, can't sit there. That's Hilda Hein, but see, it's reserved for her. Mercy is reserved for all of us. And in Christ has your name written on his hands to know that that mercy is available no matter who we are, no matter what we have done or said or felt, no matter the depth of our sin, there is mercy. You are not the worst thing you have ever done. But we know a God who is greater than all our sin who is full of mercy and grace and truth and love, and that God sends you out into the world to live in the joy and the peace of that good news. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.